I read your article. Um, it was very interesting for me to read it. Um, I have a few questions for you, and I hope to hear um, your positions and ideas and um, maybe recommendations for other countries to remain in power. So uh, before uh, we get into the questions regarding the um, content of our article, for those of our readers who may not be familiar with your research, could you give us a quick introduction to your background as a scholar? Um, author, and perhaps you might also be um, willing to share a quick summary of your research interest. So uh, geopolitical studies are my field of expertise. My main contribution to geopolitics is my model of neoclassical geopolitics which is an attempt of a two-level approach. So combining international and domestic variables in order to explain foreign policy and international politics outcomes within the geopolitical reasoning. So I have been applying and testing this model in several publications of mine. One of them is my paper on Portuguese geopolitical design published by the Journal of Territorial and Maritime Studies that we will talk about in a few minutes time. Um, what else can I say? I teach uh, geopolitics, strategy, and international relations at the university. And also online, I have uh, two online courses on geopolitics on my website, on my personal website. It's uh, geopoliticalstudies.weeksite.com slash website. And I would like to extend an invitation to the audience to enroll and to attend my online courses on geopolitics if they are interested in this field of knowledge. Um, as an author, uh, apart from my papers, I also published a collective book with several experts on geopolitics earlier this year. It is titled Geopolitics in the 21st Century, uh, Territories, Identities and Foreign Policies. It was published by Nova Science uh, in New York and it received quite good reviews, frankly, which uh, made me very happy. So um, from that point, uh, give me a right to ask you a second question regarding your paper. So um, as I understood, your research covers um, and explains historical experience and background of domestic and foreign policy making in Portugal. Um, and address the matters of geography and identity, which is uh, and those criteria are very important criteria indeed. Article also provides how Portuguese foreign policy has been shifted and modified. Um, however, as you underlined in your article, there is a still um, incongruity between the independent variables of geography, identity, and dependent variable um, of EU membership in making of Portugal's nation, a national security policy. Therefore, from your point of view, how Portugal may balance between national interest Trans a transatlantic relationship and EU membership, making into account all national, political, and geographical um, circumstances, including mm -hmm. geopolitical circumstances as well. Because uh, it seems to me that this is an important experience for state to balance um, those circumstances and to create the policy in order to remain sip over a country. Thank you very much for your question. So in, in, the current, in the current circumstances, in the Portuguese case, it is a hard balance to maintain, uh, not to say that there is actually no balance. Because uh, if geography uh, and identity point in one direction, mm -hmm. Uh, which is the maritime option, and this means uh, better relations with the United States, better relations with the UK, with Brazil, with Japan, and with other maritime countries, uh, plus investing in maritime industries, investing in naval forces, in merchant navy, etc. On the other hand, the Portuguese geopolitical agents, or the decision makers, if you prefer, they are committed uh, to uh, the European Union membership, from where their beliefs, their ideas, their policies, and their funding come from. So in this way, what I mean by 
there is no balance between quotation marks refers to the fact that uh, the remaining Portuguese traditional maritime policies are tolerated only when they can be accommodated with the European Union directives and norms. That means when there is a clash or a mismatch between the two, mm -hmm. it is the European Union directives that prevail and they prevail over geography, over identity, over national interests, etc. So research results show these realities on the specific cases of the elimination of the Portuguese fishing fleet that I covered in the paper, also the dismantlement of the Portuguese Navy that I also covered in the paper. There, is, there are obviously more cases, for example, in the case of President Trump's term, when there was a better opportunity for bilateral relations between Portugal and the United States. And instead of taking the chance, the Portuguese government distanced uh, itself from the United States and uh, approached Brussels even more. So in a sentence, instead of a balance uh, in, in the specific case of Portugal, which is the one that I covered in the paper, we can say that in Portugal, it exists an a critical decision accommodating process, as I called it, meaning importing to Portugal what is roughly decided in Brussels from the foreign policy point of view. Is it helpful and how it complicated the situation of Portugal when uh, the policy should, European policy should prevail? Is it in, in the interest of Portugal? To uh, answer that question, then we need to go to other levels. Uh, it also depends on uh, what is your social class. For example, if you have an industry devoted to tourism, it has been quite beneficial because the funding that came from the European Union was mainly directed to services and mainly to tourism. So you had quite a prosperity. But now in COVID times in which the industry of tourism, if it's not that it's close to it, the economy is being dragged down also by this collapse in tourism and services. And the point is, what else do you have as an alternative? And the answer is nothing. So if it has been beneficial for the last decades and the economy of the country has been improved quite a lot since 1986 when Portugal joined the, the European Union, that's, that's, that's absolutely accurate. On the other hand, as we said in Portugal, you put all your eggs in one basket only. And when this basket is broke, then you have no alternative. So one of the points that I was trying to hit with this paper was exactly this. So there was no uh, alternative from the strategic point of view. It was only focused on the directives of Brussels. The European Union is a tolerocratic organization, meaning continental or land power oriented one. So it doesn't have much of view concerning the seas. And if it does, it's only seas very close to the European Union, so the Baltic Sea or the North Sea. There is definitely not a global maritime strategy from the European Union that does not exist from more, as far as my knowledge goes. And hence, countries which would have this uh, approach, at least traditionally, which is the case of Portugal, uh, loses this, uh, these possibilities within this decision accommodating process, as I mentioned. Thank you for your answer. And it brings me to the uh, third question. Um, can you explain for readers why geopolitical concept of sea matters for states and what are new perspectives and main challenges for Portugal to remain sea power country in 21st century? Thank you very much for also this very interesting question. So uh, studies from the United Nations show that the GDP of country tends to be higher if the country has access to the sea. Moreover, shipping is responsible for more than 90% of trade between countries, 90, not 19. So these two pieces of evidence mean that even though people need land and people live on the land, it is actually at the sea level 
that we find a great deal of the potential uh, for the prosperity of the nations and states. And, and, and by prosperity, I mean not only wealth, but also political power. So projection of power with naval forces and effective control of choke points, which as a Portuguese priest in the 16th century uh, explained and, and, and then Mahan replicated the, this knowledge in the 19th century, the choke points are able to grant control over sea lines of communication once there is potential to control the choke points in the first place. Uh, within this scenario, Portugal could play a very little role. Uh, if Portugal aims to project any power on the Atlantic, which did not happen in the last decades, as I have already explained, it needs first to align its strategy with the United States and with the United Kingdom. And second, it would need to join forces with Brazil. I already published the paper with the idea of the diamond of the Lusosphere on the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> uh, but uh, whereas I perceive the first condition as easy to achieve, I remain very skeptical about the chances of the second, taking into account the situation of Brazilian politics. Yet, without these two conditions, in my view, plus with the characteristics of the Portuguese geopolitical design that I also pointed out, I do not see much possibilities for the idea of Portugal as a sea power to, to thrive. Thank you for your answer. And our final question would be um, following the context of sea power. Um, the country was changing in um, uh, time and space. And I think that you agree with this point. And there are different factors uh, which affect on the concept of sea power. Therefore, it is very difficult to agree on what sea power means for different countries and for different regions. Um, at this point, sea power countries concept is related to the issue um, such as global maritime governance and good order at sea. Nevertheless, states are putting effort to rise the, uh, the potential to remain sea power um, countries. And therefore, it brings me to the um, question that, can you elaborate how sea power countries may interact with each other and balance their interest for um, also global governance and good order at sea. Is it possible uh, in 21st century where the geopolitical situations are already intensified? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's a, a very complex question. Uh, let me start by looking at history. So the concept, or better said, the doctrine of sea power uh, has been very stable in history. And this comes until our days. Uh, we can observe an authentic line of succession of states as dominant or leading sea power at the world level since at least the 15th century. So we have first the Portuguese in the 15th century then the Spaniards in the 16th century. In the 17th century, there's a transition for the Dutch and the French. After the Seven Years' War, we have the British. And after the Second World War, we have the United States of America. Uh, from my point of view, it's not hard to assume that the Chinese will try to substitute the United States on the seas in the 21st century. As I mentioned previously, the control of the sea brings the control or influence, if you prefer a less strong word, over international trade. So, and, and this control or influence, it's either to maintain the channels open and keep international trade flowing or to shut these lines of communication with all the interests that uh, are behind to justify that decision. But either way, to maintain them open or to shut them, it's about control and influence. So I would argue that that is the essence of the dominant or the leading sea power, and that that essence can be observed in a long-term dynamics with little change, discounted of, of course, technological factors. So 
even if technology has been changing for the last 500 years, this core uh, points or lines that I just mentioned, they have been remaining the same. That, that's my perspective. Thank you for your um, time and for your answers. It was very nice to um, heard quite interesting piece um, about the poor countries, about policy and about new perspectives for um, countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. It was a pleasure.